So, um, I said I'm, uh, I work for Omni TI. Uh, for anybody curious, we do uh, like full stack support for like high traffic websites. There's some examples there: um, Gilt, Etsy, uh, Etsy, and OrTV, which is a fairly new. It's a, one of the first online um, TV channels. Like it's exclusively online, has no television, like traditional TV presence. So it's kind of interesting. And we also host a Surge conference, which is uh, mostly about like uh, web scalability and stuff like that. It's actually next week. So if you're interested in all, it's uh, in the National Harbor in DC. And we're also hiring a bunch of stuff, DBAs, of course, sysadmins. So I had to put that in there. Anybody curious? This is your like, first Postgres conference. Just like a little brief little history there. Um, it's an open source relational database management system. Um, actually, it's, it's a lot older than people think it is, and uh, so it started in eight, uh, 86 and was open sourced in 96. BSD tab license means you can do whatever you want with it, however you want with it, with no cost or even attribution. Um, it's one that uh, follows SQL close, uh, standard very closely. Um, the major version is actually not the first number in the version, it's the first two numbers. So it's uh, x.x, .x, and they're done roughly every year, usually around the fall. Um, minor patches as needed, and usually when there's a minor patch released, all minor versions are patched that are currently under support. So, and the other big plus of it is, um, that makes it a little bit different, is it supports a lot of um, third-party uh, tools and plugins. You can write, like most database systems have a uh, procedural language you can do, and it's their procedural language, like PL, uh, PLSQL and Oracle and stuff. You can write it in all of those languages and more in Postgres, so you can stay which, with whatever language you're comfortable with. Um, and I'll get into the extensions and background workers. Um, if you ever see anything orange on here, these are actual links to go to those, um, to go to those websites. So if you want to sign up on the mailing list or get some real-time support on, on IRC, that's all available. So it's a brief history of some of the older releases. You can see started back in the first official version release uh, was in March 1998. And it, you can see it followed that yearly release uh, schedule pretty closely, um, a couple times even more than once in a year. Uh, and so weird pattern I noticed when I put this chart together, and you'll see it actually in one of the versions later, that um, you can see there's... Uh, Seven all ended in three, and eight all ended in 23. So just weird little patterns that show up every once in a while in the versioning releases. Let's see. So let's get started with some more in-depth features. Um, 8.4 is still pretty prevalent as an installation um, out there, uh, mostly due to, uh, I believe it's uh, CentOS and Red Hat have that as a, the, still have that as a default version even though it's completely out of support now, um, as, of last, as of last year. So, um, but one of the big major, uh, some of the big major features it introduced were window functions. Um, if you went to Stella's talk the other day, she went into this a lot more in a, in, in a lot more detail. So you can find her slides. She has a lot more detail on these than I do. Um, but uh, basically it's for doing uh, calculations across specific sets of rows. You can see it, it uses major, major mainly uses this over clause. Um, if you don't give anything in the over clause, it pretty much does what it would do if you didn't have it in there. You can see it just does a, a, a running sum of the salary column. Um, but if you start using some of the special features that are in there, like the order by, it does a running sum as of that current row, as it goes down, which can be challenging to do without this kind of a, a, a functional capability. Um, they also have this uh, partition by clause. Um, it allows you to do things. This is actually doing uh, a running average of the salaries per the, uh, so it's doing the average of the salary column per the department name. So you can see all of the, de uh, the de developer department. That's the average of all, of, that's the average of all of theirs. Then it goes to the personal one. That's the average of all of theirs. So you can get a running average per other columns. Um, the other thing it has the ability to do is ranking. So we're again partitioning by the department name, ordering it by the salary, and then it's going, 
the ranking of the salaries per the department. So you can see, and if there's a tie, it keeps the same number and skips the next one. So you can see first place is 6,000, second and third place, which is just labeled two, is 5,200, then 45, then it starts over again. So if you're using the ranking, just be careful of that with, the, with ties. You have to be account for that. It's not a, it's not a running row count. It's a, it's a ranking. The other thing that was introduced, um, and this is actually really, really powerful once you start seeing this and seeing how they're actually used, is uh, common table expressions, or some people call them with queries. Um, it's essentially uh, on-the-fly temp tables. Um, if, you don't need, if you don't need a temp table that needs indexes and, and anything uh, fancy like that, you can do that. And they're also um, usable. You can have multiple with queries in a single query. So you can see there's the regional sales one, and then the top regional one actually selects from the previous one to reuse it again. And then it finally uses um, both of them in the, uh, in the last one. So it's, they're very, very handy. You can pretty much use this in, in, in the place of a lot of subselects to make your queries a lot more easy to read and, and in a lot of cases more efficient. For like cor some correlated subqueries, how it has to rerun that subquery over and over again. If you can fit this, that correlated subquery into a with query, it doesn't have to rerun that subquery over and over again. It runs it once and just reuses it so it can be a lot more efficient. And the other example of this, I, I can't get into too much detail. Um, so I have a lot of things to cover, but you can also do recursive queries. Um, this is just a simple example of doing a running sum from one to 100. Um, like most recursive things, you, you give it the start value, you give it, and then you union it with your condition to have it increment and go back to itself, and you also put that con the ending condition in there as well. Uh, the other big uh, feature, that, and this was pretty big for people that uh, back in 8.4, before PG upgrade existed, and before that, um, upgrades were a big pain because the only way to do it was a dump and restore. Um, this option in parallel res in, in PG restore made the uh, at least the second step of the upgrade significantly faster um, if your I/O could support it. Um, and it's it's parallel in the way that if you tell it you want to be restoring ten objects at a time, it doesn't do a block of ten and then move on to the next block of ten. It does ten, and as soon as one of those is finished, it grabs another one. So it's always doing ten at a time. So it's a really really efficient parallel restore. And some other additional features that came in there. Um, if you do a lot of if you do a lot of writing of functions. Um, you definitely want to get on to 8.4 because it lets you set defaults for your function values and actually do variadic parameters. Um, you can set column permissions. Um, that was added in 8.4. Uh, per database locale settings is actually a pretty unique feature in, in Postgres. Not quite so much anymore, but at the time when this came out, it was pretty unique. In the same cluster, you could have English, Russian, Chinese, and Japanese all in the same cluster in each database having its own specific locale. So that was a pretty um, unique feature in Postgres. Um, more advanced uh, secure authentication. Um, if you were a database admin at the time of 8.4, getting into what automatic sizing of free space map is a whole talk in itself. But if you're an administrator of 8.4, of 8.3 and earlier, and you weren't doing that, you were going to run into problems at some point, and you need to do that. So this eliminated a huge administrative headache in Postgres. Um, another thing a lot of people don't really know about is you can actually live edit in the database functions that you have in there. Just in, with the PSQL client, you just do slash EF and it'll bring up whatever you have your uh, console um, editor configured as Vim or Nano or whatever, it'll bring up that editor and you can edit the function live and then commit it right back in without having to go outside of the database. So it's good for those late night um, on-call emergencies where you have to fix something. And some other uh, PG stat statements is a really, really handy, and I'll explain, are really handy for getting an idea of where your slow queries are. Auto explain, if a query is, takes a certain amount of time to run, it'll automatically put the explain plan in your, um, uh, uh, in your Postgres log, which can be very, very handy. And if you use B-trees, there's a very, very, uh, and, and gin indexes, it's very handy. So at this point, a friendly reminder that 8.4 is out of support, so if you're before this, and on the, or on this version, and 9.0 as of this month, they go out of support. So it's definitely time to do your upgrades. There's no security updates and no data corruption fixes, and there are data corruption issues in 8.4 and older. 
especially in replication. So if you're, if you're on those versions on like major production systems, there is a significant incentive for you, besides the other features I'll show you as we go on, to get your, to get your updates done. Um, and also, um, as of, uh, I think it's 847, was when PG Upgrade could, be, could start being used. I have it in a later slide. It allows you much easier upgrades using PG Upgrade if you get to this point and later. You can have downtimes of seconds instead of minutes for dumps and restores. So, and, and just a shameless plug, we do this kind of stuff all the time. So if you need help doing upgrades, we're happy to help with that. So onto the first 9.0. 9 uh, you can see that EOL is um, this month. So the big reason it changed from 8 to 9 was this feature, was streaming replication. Before this, um, you had to use either really complicated um, self-written commands or third-party tools to do replication in Postgres. And since it, since it was relying on shipping wall files over, there was a pretty good chance of even like a good chunk of data loss during failover. So this was a major, major improvement. You actually have lag times between your master and slave in, down in the uh, uh, milliseconds. It's very, very, you very likely not to have any data loss and failover um, with streaming replication. Also allowed uh, hot standby, which um, allows you to do read-only queries on your slaves. Um, it's also a better. It's also a very good security tool. If you if you really want to make sure nobody can write to the database, but you want to allow them connections, you can give them access to your uh, slaves instead of your major your master production system, and they can do their queries and stuff like that. And as I said, PG upgrade um, that was introduced in this version as well. Um, yeah, it goes back to 8.4.7. Uh, just as, as an example, what we did an, an upgrade for a client the other day that was, their database was 1.2 terabytes. The actual upgrade time was about, was about a minute and 40 seconds. So it's very, very low downtime. That doesn't include, when you do a PG upgrade or a failover, that resets the statistics. So you have to go through and run analyze again. But there's a, a special staged analyze that you can get running to get a, a quick batch of statistics, and then I'll go back and get more. So um, it significantly reduces the downtime for really, really big systems. So this is a, a big plus for getting off of those older versions. So, and some other features that were added in there. Um, I find that first one really, really handy, that if you just need to give all, like a user permissions to everything in the schema, there's a single command to do that instead of having to just custom write a script to loop through a bunch of stuff. You can just do grant all to grant all in schema to roll, and you're good to go. And also, default privileges were added. Um, some people think that means that you can just set privileges for any object that's created in the database. That's not actually what it is. It's granting privileges that a specific user creates. It, it, you, uh, that user's objects that it creates get grant set to it. So in this case, you, what, what we usually have people do is um, have a, a dedicated role for managing and owning the objects, and that role creates, creates all the database objects. And then all the permissions you need by default in your database are just all done, and they're, and they're there. Um, better vacuum full. Um, before uh, 9.0, if you did a vacuum full, it would solve the bloat in your table, but would increase the bloat in your indexes, which so then you'd have to go back and do re-indexes on your table, and if it was a primary key, that was a big hassle. Um, so the vacuum full in 9.4 is significantly uh, better. It doesn't, it actually gets rid of all the bloat. It just rewrites the entire table, rewrites all the indexes, and you're good to go. Um, if you're on Windows, this actually was the first version to get your full 64-bit support. Um, anonymous code blocks are pretty handy. You can pretty much think of that as just, if you're, instead of having to write a dedicated PLPGSQL function, you can do PL, PGSQL code or C or whatever code you want to do on the fly, just write in the, in the console and like do like loops and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, deferrable unique constraints, that's uh, if you have a unique constraint on a, on a column, instead of having to check every single time a new row is put in, you can defer it to the end of the transaction. So if you're doing a 10,000 row insert, it doesn't do the check on each individual row, it waits till after the 10,000 rows are in and then does the check. So it allows some fancy logic and some um, things. And it, it enhanced explain plans. Um, Jim did a, a talk earlier to, uh, yesterday about explain plans, and he showed how 
useful these other export options can be. If you need to put your explained plans in something that's easily parsable, you can do it in JSON. Um, the YAML output is actually significantly easier to read as a human. A lot of people don't, don't realize that, so it's pretty handy. Uh, 9.1 features. So this is the, at, you at least want to be on this version um, by now, if not soon. But hopefully you go just go straight for 9.4. So uh, this introduced the feature of foreign data wrappers. Um, if this, is, this actually is part of the SQL standard. If you want to look it up, it's actually called Management of External Data, or SQL MID. Um, so it allows you to connect to remote databases, file systems, or any kind of pretty much any service that spits data out. If you know how to write something in C to read that data and put it in Postgres, you can connect it to that. So there's a list of, uh, of some of the stuff there. There's a key one missing there that I'll get to later. But you can you can connect to Oracle, MySQL, Twitter. Somebody did it. Somebody has a Twitter, FDW. Um, Andrew Dunstan made one called the black hole, which like just takes your data and throws it away, which actually is more useful than you think it might be. And it's actually a good, it's actually a really, really good framework foreign data wrapper. If you want to look at how to how to write one, um, his black hole foreign data wrapper is a really good template because it does all the things you would need to do, but it doesn't actually do anything. So it's a it's a really good template. Um, in most cases, joins and where conditions are can be sent to the remote system. That is entirely dependent on the person that wrote the foreign data wrapper to actually implement that. So it's possible to do it, but it may not be possible in the foreign data wrapper you're using. You have to look and see what the capability is. The Oracle and MySQL and SQL Server ones, I'm pretty sure those, uh, sh pretty sure those do it. So, um, but there's still major issues. If you try to join local tables with foreign tables, it will be really, really slow. So don't think you can use this as some, uh, as, as, as a system that, that can just, you can just have your remote databases out there and just use them as normal. There are big caveats to this. But it actually also makes migration uh, to Postgres from different things very easy. I did an upgrade um, from Oracle for another client and the data migration was as easy as a select star from, an insert to select star from. That was the data migration. Um, so uh, the hard part is the, uh, is the uh, the function code that's in Oracle, you can't just copy that over. Um, but that makes, it makes data migration from other databases to Postgres as, as about as easy as you can imagine it could be. So the other big thing, and this is one of the things that I, that I really got into, is um, writing extension code, writing extensions. Um, you can think of them like packages in Oracle. They're not, they're not, quite, they're not quite that advanced. Um, but they work similar to, similarly to that, um, where it's basically you're taking a, a group of objects, be they, they functions, views, um, tables, and you're, you're, you're defining that schema and what they contain, and you're giving it a version, and you're putting that in the database, and when you see that version in the database, you know what it has. Um, and so it makes it really easy for if you have to deploy code across multiple databases and you want to make sure it's the same, put it in an extension and you can just check the version and you're sure all your systems are on the, running the same embedded code in the database. Um, and it makes upgrades and downgrades tremendously easier because you just pretty much define creating and replacing this function, altering this table, dropping this, doing this. You define all those steps in the upgrade and you can actually downgrade as well. Um, you have to write specific downgrade code. It's not just automatic that it'll downgrade something. But um, if you provide the downgrade methodology, you can, you can have all that in there. Um, what, what is still called the contrib modules, which things like uh, DBLink, PGStat statements, I showed already uh, auto explain, those are actually now all extensions. So they're, they're all, they're all man all the stuff inside Postgres is managed how everybody else manages, manages it as well. So it makes installing things like that very easy, um, as long as like if you have like uh, Debian or Red Hat or whatever, you can just install the contrib package, and then installing the extensions is as, as simple as going create extension, whatever the name is, and it's installed, and you're done. Um, made things like PostGIS tremendously easier to install. That was um, one of the big 
hard parts of managing PostGIS is installing and upgrading and managing it. This made that fun uh, 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 contrib module much easier. Um, PG Reback is another example of a third party one. That's for um, the, the vacuum full I told you about before. If you do a vacuum full to get rid of bloat, that locks the table for the entire run of the vacuum full. PG Repack allows you to get around that. It just takes a brief lock to do some table swapping and it does all the stuff on the background. So if you have like a, a billion row table you have to do bloat removal on, uh, PG Repack is a pretty good tool. And PG Partman is the one that I wrote for doing um, time and uh, ID series partitioning. Uh, it automatically manages the, uh, the updating the function, creating new partitions, dropping old partitions if you need to. Um, uh, some constraint exclusion stuff, so makes writing your code in Postgres a lot easier. Um, so I talked about CTEs before. This introduced um, writable CTEs. So before the remote database was read only, now the remote database is actually writable as well, using normal update insert commands as as normal. And uh, it makes things. This is an example of of things you can do with the with the returning clause. So here we're deleting from the products table and just doing a returning star. And then we just want to keep a log of whatever we deleted over in this other table. So you, you could do this before. You would just have you would just do the select of that. You just do an insert select of that data before and then go delete it. This allows you to just do it all in one query. Um, and somebody else in our office found this fun thing about writable CTEs. Um, if you have Transaction like uh, application transactional logic that should all be done in a single step. Usually, used used to like the, in this case, there's there's three insert statements. This was all done in a single transaction before we had to begin do our three inserts and then do the commit. You can actually wrap that into a single writable CTE command. So you can do the insert here, use the re returning ID. Then we go to our next insert. We're actually using the using the user ID from the previous one to insert it. And the question marks are, if you write Perl code, that's the um, prepared statement placeholder. So these are values coming in from whatever the application is, is what the question marks are. Um, and then you can see we do our third insert again. And this actually, as I said, it's, it can have a significant performance improvement because you're not doing round trips for every, um, like you do the insert, then it has to go back and do send another command, then it goes back and send another command. This avoids all of the, uh, the, the network round trip of all of that. So it's an interesting side effect that we, we started using with, with some of the clients that do a lot of transactional logic like this that are the, where everything in the transaction is really closely related. So. Um, some additional features is uh, synchronous replication. This is where if you want to make sure um, all of your slaves are in 100% sync of the master, the master will actually wait for the slave to respond back that it committed to the wall stream on the slave before the master responds that it's committed. So um, usually in this case you want to have more than one slave configured and then you'll, you'll just say you want to wait for at least one of your slaves to respond, then you're not causing too, bad, too big of a headache, because if there's network contention, you only have one slave, or that one slave goes down. If the slave goes down, if all the slaves go down, you have synchronous replication turn on, nothing can write to the master. So it's a good thing. Um, serializable transaction isolation, that's a whole talk series in itself about what that is and how it works. Um, basically, if you, if you want to make sure, if you're in a system like a, like a banking system where you want to make sure things always happen in a specific order and if they don't happen in that order, they shouldn't happen, this is uh, something that uh, was still, I don't know if it was unique to Postgres at this time. It wasn't unique to Postgres at this time, but only the really, really, like Oracle and like the big commercial databases were the only ones that had this. So this was a significant gain for Postgres. Unlogged tables are something people don't usually know a lot about that were added. Um, they're really useful for things that, and tables that you rebuild every day or that are, that are uh, stuff like that because it skips writing all of those writes to the wall stream. It just doesn't do that. So these are not crash safe. If your database goes down or crashes, you will likely lose data in these tables. Um, the, ta the table is not replicated to the slaves because it's not in the wall stream. So if you fail over, you will lose all these tables. But it can significantly increase the, perform the right performance on tables that you can rebuild the data for. So like, like websites where you're getting hit 
you're getting a website hit data in that you're just rebuilding it off the uh, like the, the the web server logs to do uh, aggregation, all that kind of stuff, where you can just rebuild this data. You can significantly improve the performance of getting that data in the database with uh, with unlog tables. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Yep. Um, there's no easy way to, you can't just switch a table from unlog to log yet. In 9.5, you actually can do that. The, the issue with that, though, is it rewrites the table when you, when you switch it. You lose all the benefits. Yeah, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you have like that inter intermediate table that you, like ha you want to like get, get the data ingested as fast as possible and then do your processing, yes, that's, that's what this is perfect for. Yeah. This is also, they're also really handy for if you have synchronous replication turned on and you don't want to worry about the table waiting on commits from the, from the slave, unlog tables will not, uh, will not listen to synchronous replication. So if you just want an easy way to bypass synchronous replication on your master, you can make it an unlog table. Any other questions on stuff? No. Uh, 9.2. Uh, this is the uh, this is actually the other version we see most outside of outside of 8.4. This is the other major version we see a lot of people still on. Thankfully, it's it's still in support um, for another two years, so we're good there. Um, but this was one of the other biggest versions we saw people migrating to. I think mostly because I think Ubuntu and their supported versions went from 8.4 to 9.2, and I think their LTS version or something like that, and and a lot of things like that. So. This is another really popular uh, version that's out there. We'll probably see this one on a, in a lot of people's systems. The where, where 8.4 is now, well, 9.2 will be the new 8.4 in the future. So, but the thing with this is, at this point, your upgrades are much easier than they used to be. So, hopefully, we don't see it as much as we saw 8.4. Um, this is a very unique feature of Postgres. No other database has this data type. Um, so. Uh, it essentially, uh, it, it's a little bit easier to understand when, once I get to some of the other examples, but it allows you to define a data, data type that's actually a range of data. From, so it has a beginning, and a defined beginning, a defined end, and the values are, are in that range somewhere. Um, just some examples. It uses like mathematical set notation. So this is, um, includes three, but that does not include seven, and it's all the values in between there. Um, so it doesn't include three and seven, but all the values in between. So. It works how you, if you've ever done set notation and stuff, this works exactly how set notation uh, would, you would think it would work. Um, when you define a, a, a data type, it's just, a, um, this is a, the TS range, there's also the int range. So this is a timestamp range. Um, the values that are in this range are every, everything from uh, January 1st, 2010 to, or actually just in this one little hour, uh, hour. So this is like a room reservation at a hotel. Um, if you've ever had to write a reservation system before or manage it, doing, doing blocks of reserve time and overlap is you think you go into that thinking it's easy and it's, it's actually a really, really big headache to manage that. This removes almost all of that headache because it, it's, it's, def, it's a defined range, so there's easy, an easy operator to do overlaps between uh, values. Like the, uh, I have it for the integers down here. So... Um, Actually, or containment. So you're seeing if uh, is is three contained in the range ten to twenty? No, it's false. Um, um, here, uh, this is the overlap. Uh, do do these ranges overlap? Is eleven dot one dot two to twenty between uh, between these two? So uh, where is it? Uh, you can get the upper bound of your range really easy. Um, and you can do the intersection of, of ranges. So there's two ranges, 10 to 20 and 15 to 25. The intersection's uh, 15 to 20. And the output, the output of ranges uses the same set notation, so you know if it's inclusive or exclusive. So it's, it's really very, very handy. Um, I got this example from Jonathan Katz. He hosts the, uh, uh, the, the New York uh, conference. Um, the uh, PGUS that's held in New York, and he also hosts the, the New York Pug. 
So this is a really good example to, of how this can make your life easier. So this is like you have a, a, a car database. And normally, normally um, I, didn't, I don't have the example of that, but normally you'd have, um, you'd have the ID, the name, but then you'd have a min price range column or a min co price column and a max price column. Um, this is just showing how you define it in the, um, the range type here in a single column instead. So say you have, you have a budget of $13,000 to $15,000, you want to buy a car, you want to find all of the cars in that price range. First thought doesn't seem like a complicated query. Then you go and try to write it to handle all those conditions. So you have, you can imagine for, for larger and, and, and more complicated queries, stuff like this gets immensely complex, especially like if you're doing a reservation system on time. This can be incredibly complex stuff. So you have to write queries like that. With the new range type, it's a simple query like that. And it gives you the answer that you wanted. So um, for established systems, this is a big migration off of this because there are ORMs have no idea about this data type. So if you're using an ORM, you're, you're not going to get to use this. But if you're, um, if you're writing your own application, if you're writing a new application and you need time or ID intersection and stuff like that, use this data type and save yourself just massive headaches. Uh, and if you have the time to do a migration for your existing system, um, this, is, this, this is a significant benefit going forward as far as just maintainability of your code. I mean, it would depend on the queries you're, you're writing. I mean, you, could, you saw the other one that has all those other conditions to, to so it would really depend on, the, on, the, on the, the level of the conditions and stuff that you're managing, whether, it, whether there is a noticeable performance improvement. In that other case, yes, you would see a massive performance improvement. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, it would really all depend on, on what your application was doing. It's really more uh, uh, a simplification of application code by, by, by a significant margin than, than anything. So, well, I mean, you're less likely to leave out some. Yes, yes. Some yep. So, another uh, 9 2 feature was cascading replication. Don't run into this too often unless you start getting into bigger data warehousing systems and stuff. This let, it's essentially lets you do a slave of a slave um, and stuff like that. Uh, but um, if you have a lot of slaves, every slave on the master is a load on the master to send its wall stream over to the slave. So um, uh, if you, and when you start getting into some of the newer features like I'll show you uh, later with replication slots, that can be uh, a big, uh, cause a huge backlog of, of old wall files on your master. So if you want to avoid having that load on your master, you can have all the, you can have a slave of a slave and then do like 10 slaves off of that slave and your master's fine, so um, doing a, doing failover at nine two was actually a little bit tricky. You actually would have to rebuild all of you would have to rebuild all of the uh, if you're doing streaming application and not sending the wall files over. You would have to rebuild all your cascading slaves as well. If you fail, like, so you fail over one master to your slave, all of the other systems that were slaves before would have to be rebuilt on that new master. Um, nine three. Um, lets you actually have the slave pick up the new master after a cascading slave failover. So um, some other features that were added in 9.2. Um, the index-only scan is actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's another part of the SQL standard that was finally added. If the query you're running, if all the data, it's essentially if all the data you are getting back resides in the index, it doesn't have to go to the table at all and just pull all the data right from the index. So doing a count star, for example, you don't need, and there's an index on the table, you can just go to the index and get the, get the value back. Um, and the, this was the first introduction of the da uh, JSON data type. Essentially, all 9.2 gave you was, was validation. Um, the functions for JSON in 9.2 and, uh, and the operators were very, very limited. So, I mean, val JSON validation itself is, is pretty significant, and a lot of people started using it, but then they realized the limitations of trying to get that data back out and, and managing it, and 9.2 was, um, they backported some of the 9.3 things that were added in an extension, but um, it was still kind of limited in 9.2. So if you're on 9.2 and looking at JSON, you want to upgrade soon. Um, so 9.3.
this is actually a big a big plus for people uh, that do like more system administration kind of a thing. So this is the, the typical setup you usually usually go through. You install OS, install your Postgres packages. Um, the package has a default value. The, I think they increased this. The shared buffer's default value I think is now 128. It used to be 32. So you don't need any more memory than that, right? That, so that was that was the default. But then you go you go set that to anything anything you any useful value for shared buffers in these old and 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 Ubuntu and and Red Hat and those systems like that, and you you, you would get something similar to this, something complaining about the sh uh, the shared memory max uh, kernel setting not being high enough. So you would have to know enough about system administration to go in and adjust these values to even get your database to start with a sane shared buffers value. So um, 9.3 uh, got rid of this um, thing. If you really want to know the details of the how and why, um, Robert Haas is one of the core committers of Postgres. He's the one that fixed this feature. And he has a really, really good blog post that's, that's an active link there of explaining why this was an issue, why it took so long to get it fixed, and how he fixed it. So uh, 9.3 is a big, for, for new deployments, 9.3 is a big uh, time saver as far on, on uh, when you're using package uh, Postgres. Uh, see, this is the other uh, fun thing that was introduced that um, I actually started working uh, using myself a little bit. The custom background worker. So if you ever done like a PS um, on the Postgres uh, and like look for Postgres processes um, on your database, um, you'll see thing. You've seen background workers. They've always existed in Postgres. The the right, the postmaster, the logger, the auto vacuum, all of those things, they were independent background processes in Postgres before. They've always been there, or not always, but been there for a long time. This now allows you to write them yourself, to do literally whatever you can write and see and interact with Postgres, you can do in a background worker. Um, in 9.3, and in 9.3, they start and stop with along with the database. So you don't have to worry about um, some uh, other uh, project or application having not starting up in time with the database. It starts up when the database starts, and it stops when the database stops. So it's really handy there. Um, you can set custom configuration options right in the PostgreSQL.com file, just like all of the, um, like uh, if you use PG stat statements and a couple other things, you'll see they have custom uh, options to add to the PostgreSQL.com. Um, this lets you write your own custom options to do however you want. As an example, the, the partition manager that I wrote, you used to have to use cron or some other external scheduling tool to run and have your, the partition maintenance uh, run, create new partitions and drop the old ones. I actually wrote a background worker so you don't need cron anymore. You just give your, put, set your time interval in the PostgreSQL.com, set, set the databases you want it to run on, set the user it runs as, starts up and runs with the database. So um, I've, I've really been hoping somebody makes, and there, there's people talking about it all the time. Um, if I ever have the time, maybe I'll do it. I want a generalized scheduler for Postgres. That's one of the big shortcomings of Postgres that a lot of other databases have built in. Um, Solando made a, uh, a plugin called Worker. Oh, OK. All right, all right, cool. I didn't, didn't know that yet. So he said uh, somebody made a, a plugin called Elephant Worker. That as a scheduler, so it's a very very handy feature, and it also made a lot of other people started making uh, um, a lot of other really more advanced um, uh, extensions for Postgres that are starting to take advantage of of using this now that the Postgres now that the database itself can just manage everything for you and do things automatically in the background without needing anything else. Um, some more uh, 9.3 features. Like I said before, JSON was really limited in 9.2. It's a lot more, use, a lot more useful in 9.3. Um, not as useful as 9.4, but still, uh, all the opera, a lot of the functions and operators were added in 9.3 to make searching, to make searching through down, down through the JSON tree easier and doing comparisons and all that kind of stuff. Um, lateral joins, uh, they're hard to explain without Examples. I didn't really have the time to get into examples. Um, Stella did a good example yesterday of them. They're really handy when you come across needing them, but you don't always need them too often. Um, but they're they're there now. They're they're part of the SQL standard, so they're uh, they're actually I 
I have writable foreign data wrappers in there again. Um, if you I remember when I had the list of foreign data wrappers on 9.2 or 9.1, there was one missing. It was Postgres. There was no Postgres foreign data wrapper. So you couldn't connect to remote Postgres databases. So they finally added that in 9.3. It's probably one of, mo one of the most feature-filled foreign data wrappers that's out, that's out there. Um, so it's, very, it's, it's a very good example of a, of a foreign data wrapper and, and what they can do. So um, this also introduced parallel PG dump. So back in, all the way back in 8.4, uh, 8 we got the parallel restore. Now you actually have parallel dump as well if, if, if you need it. You have, it, it uses the, um, there's, if you look at the, output, uh, at the output formats of PG dump, there's a directory output format where it actually puts all of the objects in their own files and directories. So this uses that format. So you don't, you don't get a single PG dump file output when you do this because you really can't do parallel writing to a single file. But this, allowed, this now allows you to do parallel PG dumps. So if you have to do, um, uh, you ha if you have to do a dump and restore um, upgrade for some reason, or you're just trying to get things quickly over to another system, this, this allows it to go very, a lot faster. They didn't introduce materialized views in 9.3, but nobody really used them because they didn't, they, they didn't automatically refresh, and if you did refresh it, it locked the view. So it really wasn't much better than things were before, but it, it put the groundwork in place for them existing for things to hopefully get better in the future. And this also introduced things uh, that checksum the data pages. So if you're not using a file system like ZFS or anything like that that does checksumming, uh, this will increase the data integrity of your of your database. It's a good idea. It does a little bit of overhead, but the overhead is worth it for this feature. You ha you, you can't just go turn this on. You have to reinitialize a cluster or make a new or set this when you create the cluster. But um, that's where the that's handy. So 9.4, the current version that's out right now. This introduced the binary JSON th data types, so JSON is even more useful. Um, uh, EDB did a really good benchmark, uh, Postgres versus Mongo, and Postgres so far seems to be leading Mongo in some areas uh, as far as performance. So it does the uh, same JSON data validation as before. Um, so this now, now allows indexing and more efficient queries, and there's new operators that were added for it. So the, some examples, you just define your JSONB uh, data type there. Um, you can do your inserts the same as they were before. So there's their first two values, and then there's a JSON blob right there. And then so if you just want to get the name out of, uh, out of the data column, there's the, this is an example of the operator. Um, you can do it in where conditions as well. Um, but now it adds indexes. So this is, this is the query plan for this select count. You can see it's doing a sequential scan across the entire thing and then doing a filter down to the JSON blob. So now you create your index on that, uh, on that JSON data type for that condition you want to handle. You can see if you look at the execution times, this is a quick query, but it, it halved the execution time. So it's a pretty big, pretty big impro Im improvement. Um, this is a really good blog post if you want to get more details about how to use JSON and JSONB. I found that, this is where I got a lot of these examples from. I found that a very useful uh, blog post. Um, this introduced replication slots. So before, the, um, the master was never aware of where the slave was as far as the, the wall stream. So if the slave went down for a while, the master would lose the walls that was keeping, and then the slave would have to be rebuilt from scratch. Um, if you put a replication slot on that slave, now the master is aware of where the slave is. If the slave goes down, the master keeps the wall files that slave needs. The slave comes back up. It just picks up right where it left off. So, um, and the upcoming logical replication feature makes big, uh, big use of uh, this as well. So, um, some more uh, nine four features. You can now uh, dynamically change the PostgreSQL.conf file on the fly, like within the database. You don't have to go to edit the PostgreSQL.conf anymore. This makes two config files. There's a PostgreSQL.conf and a PostgreSQL.auto.conf. So you have to. Now you have to have two, worry about two config files, but now you can change the, the values on the fly. Um, so materialized views are actually useful now. It doesn't lock the, re, the, the materialized view during refresh, but they're still not auto-refreshed. Hopefully a built-in scheduler will allow something like this to happen. 
Um, before the background workers could only start and stop with the uh, database, now you can start and stop them as needed, whenever you want, as the database is running. Um, for big databases, uh, PG Prewarm is a really handy uh, tool. Usually if you, if you failed over or you uh, restarted the database, you lost all the stuff that was in shared buffers and you'd have to run the queries to get the shared buffer uh, uh, that, uh, storage built up to what it was before so things run efficiently. Now you can use this PG Prewarm contrib module and preload, when the database starts, it puts that data into the shared buffers and you're back up where you need to be to be running as efficiently as you usually do. So uh, really handy uh, feature there. Um, this also added the logical decoding to the wall stream. This isn't something that most people will ever use themselves yet, but it sets the groundwork for future work. Um, Simon Riggs is doing a talk on, uh, he's actually talking about like, uh, like a developer's perspective on like doing stuff in BDR, but um, they wrote an extension called BDR for bidirectional replication. So this is, lays the groundwork for multi-master replication and logical replication, which is I only want these specific tables replicated over to the slave. I don't want the whole thing replicated to a slave. I just want these specific tables and I also want my slave to be writable. So um, this is laying the groundwork for another big uh, feature of uh, upcoming features in Postgres. And another, another thing that's actually really useful too is if you go back and uh, see here. Um, before 9.4, all you would actually see is just time. That was it. You saw how long the query took to run or think, thought it would run. 9.4 introduced splitting out the planning time and the execution time which can actually be pretty significant. You can, you can have instances where the ex planning time takes three times longer than the ex execution time. So, and this allows you to see that, uh, uh, the, that your, your performance is more on issues are more in the plan and not the query itself. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yep, yeah, that was it for 9.4. So, what's coming up in 9.2? Or 9.5, I'm sorry. Uh, the current version of 9.5 is alpha 2. So um, there is a version of this out there that's easily, fairly easily set up and installed for testing. Um, so biggest upcoming feature that everybody's excited about is Upsert. So uh, um, Peter Gohagen is doing a talk on this later today at 1.30 if you want to learn more about it. Um, this is a pretty significant uh, so if, if you don't know what Upsert is, it's if, if I'm, I'm trying to do an update, the row doesn't exist, do an insert instead. Or do an insert, if the row exists, just update it. So there's a lot of con uh, uh, race conditions and concurrency issues of doing this. So that's why it's taken so long. If you look at other databases that have this feature in there, there's a lot of caveats of using this feature that you have to be able to handle. So this handles it pretty well. Um, this also introduces row level security. Um, if you see uh, Stephen Frost around, he worked a lot on this. You can talk to him more about it. This actually lets you go down to the row level and set permissions for what rows you, uh, users can actually see. So it's a pretty significant uh, security feature. For um, management of administration, the checkpoint segments uh, option is uh, no longer there. Um, Figuring out the right value for checkpoint segments was this weird mathematical formula that you had to figure out and kind of monitor. Now you just say you want this, this value, this uh, size value at the minimum and never go larger than this value and Postgres kind of auto-tunes how many, the, the checkpoint segments is how many wall files the master keeps around in the PGX logs folder before it uh, checkpoints things out and writes them out to the tables and stuff like that. Um, this is a, uh, an under, rated fe uh, feature in 9.5. Sorting is a big part of, if you're like looking at your query plans and, like in, and you're seeing where sorts and stuff are being done, if you have uh, text and numeric data types, there is massive speed improvements in sorting for those data types. So you, will, you may see like orders of magnitude improvement in your queries after going to 9.5 and if they're using uh, indexes on, um, on text and numeric data types. It's a, and the theory behind it is abbreviated keys. Peter Gohagen is the other. He's also the guy that wrote, wrote this feature to you, so you can go talk to him about this if you want to. Um, uh, 
you can actually do table inheritance uh, on foreign tables now. So you can actually do uh, essentially sharding. You can have your table locally on the master and the slaves uh, and the child tables out on other tables, on, on other databases. Uh, PG Rewind is, uh, if you, uh, okay, we have a little bit of time left. Okay. Yeah, I, this is the last, this is my last slide, so. Um, PG Rewind, like the thing I said before, is if the, if the slave falls, or if you just do a failover, or the slave falls far enough behind, actually, no, this is for failover, not slave falling behind. If you do a failover, you have to go rebuild your old master from scratch based on the new slave. This lets you actually, like, rewind or rebuild the, the, old, uh, the old master to just reconnect to the, to, the, to the new master without having to rebuild the whole thing. So it's a significant time saver as far as administration and failover. If you have like a 1.2 terabyte database, that's a lot of data to send over the network to resync the, the, the other slaves. So all it has to do is figure out where things were, un undo them, redo them, and things are back where they were before. Um, block range indexes, uh, they're also called min-max indexes. Um, so if, uh, Makes it makes the indexes significantly smaller in storage and significantly faster in, to write to, but they contain less detailed data about what's in the index. So, um, if you're if index uh, if 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 you're doing mostly like doing stuff where max and minimum and and just looking for ranges ranges of values in your indexes, not you don't want specific values from your indexes. You're looking for large ranges of values. This can save you uh, a lot of um, I.O. on the indexes and a lot of disk space if you just need an index like that. So would you use this for, like, it's fairly common in search queries to do time-based um, queries. So I want to know, I want to see all the orders from yesterday, or I want right. to see all the orders from last night, yes. or whatever. Yeah. Could you use this to say, to block those default search things? Or um, I don't know if you'd, you'd, you wouldn't, you wouldn't define it for those specific values. You just define the block range index and so see if, and use it. With, yeah. The block range index is, is yesterday, and I mean, or is a Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen how it would, pref if it, I, I don't know how the planner would, if it would use, if you had both indexes there, if it would use the right one. Okay. I'm, I'm not quite sure on that, um, but uh, if you're primarily doing that, you don't really need the specific, if you're never going down, I mean, you can still do those specific uh, value lookups. They'll just be a little bit slower. So if the majority of your lookups are doing large ranges of values or they're looking for the, 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 the limits of those values, overall your performance will improve because most of your queries are using the more efficient index. And then the rarity, the rare index the query will come in and be slower than normal. So yeah, yeah. Um, so there's some reference uh, links, the Postgres homepage. Um, if you're looking to keep up with features and what people are doing in Postgres, uh, the plan at PostgreSQL.org community feed is really good. Or if you have your own blog and you're trying to get your, what you're doing out there to, to, to more people, um, you can add it to this feed. And that's how I have been getting what I've been doing out there is using this. Also, if, if you're running extensions, you can use the PGXN. Um, that's kind of taken over from what PG Foundry used to be since PG Foundry kind of died. Um, so this is kind of taken over from that for where to find third-party plugins and stuff for Postgres. Um, again, that's our company's website, and that's me. And if you want to make neat presentations like this, that's how I did it. Was with with uh, that tool. Essentially, all it's just an HTML web web page. Yeah. Thank you.